Let's pray together. Father in heaven, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us in your house, and more so for this opportunity to look into your word. It is our prayer that you speak to us, that the Holy Spirit will touch us as individuals, teach us your ways, teach us to pray, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your seats. Thank you, Provost, for giving me this chance to share the word of God with us today. For those who are new, I'm Burumwangi, born again and rejoicing in Christ, who is Lord and Savior in me. We continue with our theme, Christ-centered life. And for the past two weeks, uh, Reverend Kevin Kamodo has done a good job helping us look at the broad uh, framework of prayer. But today we look specifically at effective praying. Effective praying. We have already been taught that in prayer, we interact with God. We converse with God. And so when you are conversing with someone who is alive and well, you cannot be given a, a formula of how to converse with them. How they act, how they react, determines how you proceed. And so I'm not going to give us a, a cut and dry formula of how to be effective in prayers. But I want to suggest four characteristics of effective praying. Four characteristics of effective praying. And you can add on to that list later on. And here they are. One is that effective praying is accomplished by people who are close to God. Effective praying is accomplished by people who are close to God. Number two, effective praying is rooted in righteousness. Effective praying is rooted in righteousness. Number three, effective praying may simply reveal God's agenda to you. Effective praying may simply reveal God's agenda to you. In other words, it may not necessarily give you what you are looking for. And number four, effective praying is not a transaction with God. It is not but a trade that you bring this and he brings something else you exchange. And so going back to the first one, effective praying is accomplished by people who are close to God. In Exodus chapter 20, the people of Israel made a landmark decision to keep a safe distance from God. They were at the bottom of the mountain and God wanted them to get into the mountain, climb the mountain, be in his presence, talk with him. But they told Moses, this is getting dangerous. You climb, go up there, talk to God, and then come back and tell us what he has said. From Exodus 20, the next number of chapters, Moses is up there in the mountain with God. Hidden behind the fog and smoke and the thunder and the terror of God's presence. While Israel as a community are keeping a safe distance at the bottom of the hill. A safe distance from God. By the time we get to chapter 32 of Exodus, they've gotten tired and they've gotten a new inspiration from another source. This Moses and his God, we don't know what's happening out there. Maybe he will never come back. And they talk to Aaron, create for us a God we can see, a tangible God, someone we can see he is here. And within a short time, they have an idol in their hands. What should have been a beautiful time of prayer, right in God's presence, becomes a time of idol worship because of wanting to keep a safe distance. From God. And I want to pause here and ask you, however you interpret it, might you be keeping a safe distance from God? If you do so long enough, you will get some inspiration from a different source. Proximity is a prerequisite for impact. If we want to be impacted by God in our lives, and if we want to have an impact in the world for God, 
we have to draw close to God, no matter the cost. The Israelites were right. It is dangerous. There is some pruning that goes on there. There is a lot of God seeing this and putting a cold finger on it and telling you, get rid of this. There is all that and it's painful. But we are better off there than anywhere else. If we are going to be impacted by God, we have to draw closer to him because proximity is a prerequisite for impact. Our modern society is not eager to be near God. And I want to borrow the language of the young people to explain this a bit. I was listening to a group of young students I've been working with. They were dramatizing their talk, and they were talking about uh, what they would want you know, their, their future spouse to be like. So this young man comes in and says, they were very honest about this, and he says that the girl he is looking for, she should have beauty and brains. The young lady comes in and says that the young man she is looking for should be tall, dark, and handsome. I was listening, and by this time, the old school to contend as a Christian in me is worried about, they are not going to say anything about godliness. Okay, we move on. The second young man comes and says about the girl he is looking for, she needs to be outgoing and fun to be with. Then comes the second lady and she says, the young man she is looking for should, and I quote, be not too spiritual, but acknowledges God. This was the only one who mentioned God in the whole series, and that is as close as we got to God. And I borrow her words because I believe they echo the words of our society today. We don't want to be too close to God. By, by those words, you can tell she's been raised up in church. She knows the Bible. She knows the Bible says that the fool says in his heart there is no God. So she doesn't want to marry a fool. She wants someone who acknowledges God. But she also doesn't want someone who is too spiritual, always praying, we are always reading the scriptures. This might get embarrassing. She wants to keep a safe distance from God. And like the Israelites, remember, if you keep a safe distance from God long enough, you will get a different inspiration. Remember the woman with the issue of blood in Matthew chapter 9? She heard that Jesus is in town. She pushed through the crowd. She did not just go to the crusade. She went there and made sure that she literally physically touched the hem of his garment. And she got healed. Do you desire to touch him? Or might it be too embarrassing if some people got to know that you've been praying about that issue? Is this something that you would want to bring to God and mention to him and don't care what anyone thinks and tell God, it's me and you. I must touch the hem of your garment. In 2 Chronicles chapter 16, there is the story of King Asa. King Asa had experienced God's faithfulness in battle. Those kings were always fighting one another. But in chapter 16, when he was besieged, he made an alliance with a fallen king so that he would be able to strengthen his army. And because he had been a man of God, God took offense. God always wants us to draw our help from him. So he was confronted by the prophet Hanani. And Hanani reminded him, God has rescued you in the past. Why did you go out there to get help from somewhere else? But the words I want us to capture, the words that the prophet Hanani spoke, are in verse 9 of 2 Chronicles chapter 16. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. You cannot be fully committed to God and still keep a safe distance from him. The language of our God is come. Come now, he says through Isaiah. Come now, let us reason together. In the New Testament, our Lord Jesus says in Matthew 11, come to me, all ye that labor in a heavy laden. Come, don't keep a safe distance. Come to me. Nowhere does God say send someone or send some money through m and I'm going to send a reply. He says, come. Come to me. He invites us to his presence. 
And James reminds us in James 4, it come near to God and he will come near to you. And so don't wait for Moses to bring the report. Climb the mountain yourself. If you want to be effective in your prayers, if you want to, to be effective for God, draw near to God. Be a person of prayer, be a person of reading his word, be a person who fellowships with people who love God. Number two, effective praying is rooted in righteousness. From our second reading in James 5, 16, we read the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Yes, you say and I agree, there is a level of righteousness we can never reach in this life. But Jesus put it clearly for us, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. That is our gauge. Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? Are you disturbed by sin, by evil around you? Does it concern you when the people near you do things which are not pleasing to God? Or are you comfortable there? That is one way we can judge ourselves, whether we hunger and thirst for righteousness. James goes ahead to tell us about Elijah. Says that Elijah was a man like us. His prayers were effective, meaning he was able to meet that standard. He was able to be one who desired and fought for righteousness. It is possible with us. But we have to have a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. The psalmist says in Psalm 66 verse 18, If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened to me. If I had hidden sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened to me. So there's no way we can have effective praying if we have hidden and cherished and accommodated sin in ourselves. Sometimes we try to measure prayer by its length and we want to know how long did you take there. We should measure prayer by its life. What makes prayer dead is sin. If it has life, if it is done in righteousness, it's long enough to get to heaven. Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? And I want to give you an Old Testament example of the man called Job. Job was a wealthy man. We know his story and, and the troubles that came his way. But in the beginning of the book, it says that because he was wealthy and his sons were always throwing parties around, Job would take time. After the parting season was over, he would go to God's presence and repent and offer sacrifices just in case his children had done something against God. He was that averse to sin. He was that repellent to sin. He did not want sin in his camp anywhere near. He would repent of sins which he did not know whether they had been committed at all. In chapter 1, verse 1 of Job says he was blameless and upright. So what happens when trouble comes his way later? When his day of trouble came, his friends accused him of being a sinner. In chapter 13 of Job, we get a few of his responses. This is what he says. I desire to speak to the Almighty and to argue my case with God. In verse 15 he says, Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. I will surely defend my ways to his face. This is someone who is confident enough to go to God's presence. In verse 22 he addresses God himself and says, Summon me and I will answer or let me speak. And you reply, he is talking to God. That is one who hungers and thirsts for righteousness and has the confidence to approach God. It is possible with us to live a life that is acceptable before God. We know that ultimately God restored him and blessed him even more. And so when we hunger and thirst for righteousness, what happens is that we establish a common interest with our God. Our prayers resonate with his desires, and therefore they become effective prayers. Number three, effective praying may simply reveal God's agenda. This may not be a very nice one to hear, but it is the truth. It does not always yield what we went looking for. Remember Paul and the thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He says in verse 8, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Earlier on in verse 7, he says, 
to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassing great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh. What I want us to capture here is that effective prayer for Paul in this case was discovering what God was up to. It was not getting the thorn removed. Paul did not get the thorn removed, but he discovered two things. One, that God wanted to display his strength through Paul's weaknesses. Two, God intended the thorn to keep Paul away from being too proud, too elated because of what God was doing through him. Might you be having a thorn in the flesh? A chapter in your life which you wish was not there. Something which you have been wrestling with God about and he's not taking it away. I'm not saying he will not take it away. But the question is, are you able to slow down enough like Paul to hear what God is saying? To find out what is God up to with this issue? Remember the words of the hymn, Near my God to thee. One line says, Near my God to thee, even though it be a cross that raises me. Many of us have come across a cross in our lives. And we look for ways of dodging it and running away. And God is saying there is something I want to accomplish with this. Maybe the only thing that keeps pushing you towards God is that cross. Your pain, your loss, your need for that item. For some people, if they sense that God is not giving them what they want, they look for other ways. And for those ones, God cannot express his power through their lives. So choose whether you want to be available for God so that you can ultimately be able to say with Paul, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And number four, effective praying is not a transaction with God. From our second reading, we found that the Reubenites, the Gadites, the half-tribe of Manasseh, they had their prayers answered. Why? Because they cried out to God during the battle. And it goes on to say, he answered their prayers because they trusted in him. Not that they had anything to offer. Not that they, they promised him anything, but that they trusted in him. They looked up to God as their sole provider, and that's what God asks of us. Jesus said in John 14, verse 14, you may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. It means we have to reach a place where we know we are not sufficient. The price is paid. Ask in my name, not in what you are able to do. This is not a transaction. We are used to transactional relationships in our, in our society, and they have their place. But when we come to God, we need to be different. Let me give you another Old Testament example. In Judges chapter 11, we have this guy called Jephthah. Jephthah was anointed by God for a specific military expedition. Judges 11, verse 29, it says, The Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. He was about to lead his people in a military expedition, it was guaranteed success because God was with him. But in verse 30, he turns around and makes a vow to God, telling God if he gives him victory, when he comes back, the first thing that meets him at his door, he will sacrifice to God. God had not asked for anything. So he goes out, and God keeps his promise. He has victory. But when he comes back, what or who meets him at the door? his daughter. So what was supposed to be a time of praise and rejoicing in the victory that God had given becomes a time of sorrow because the daughter has to be sacrificed for a promise that was never asked for. Remember, if you take time to read about the life of Jephthah, Jephthah had suffered serious rejection from his brothers. They had told him, get out of our home because you are the son of another woman. They had thrown him out. He had been living out there, leading a gang with a lot of success because he had to live in the streets. But that had taught him not to trust because he had been rejected by his own family. Might you have some past experience that makes you treat God with suspicion? That whenever you approach God, 
regardless of all the promises in his word, you feel like telling him, okay, there's something I have to offer you here, just to make sure you will not turn around as we move with you. Might you be comparing him with your brothers who rejected you, with your parents, with your boss, with your neighbor? The promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus, as we read in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20. That is why we sing, standing on the promises that cannot fail. Another person who tried a transactional relationship with God was King Saul. You remember the story when he failed to follow instructions? And he kept some of the sheep that were to be destroyed in 1 Samuel chapter 15. When he is caught, he says, the sheep are to be sacrificed to God. This is like trying to bribe the, the anti-corruption people because they have caught you in corruption. He was trying to find a way out. But if you follow his story, you'll find that his relationship with God never recovered from that incident. What about his nemesis, King David? When King David sinned with Bathsheba and he was confronted by the prophet Nathan in 2 Samuel chapter 12, David had the opportunity to try a transaction. He could have told God, let's keep this down. You don't have to call the media. We can talk about this. If, if a child comes out of this crisis, I can bring him to the temple. He could become a priest and it would be a win-win for everyone. He could have argued. He could have tried to transact with God. But what did David do? David simply surrendered before Nathan and before God. And he said, against you, you only, have I sinned. And he was forgiven. If we come to God with the thought that we can offer him something apart from the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross, then we lose him. If we come to God's presence with the thought that we can pay with anything else and the sacrifice of his son on the cross, then we lose him. Effective prayer is desperate prayer. Effective prayer involves burning your bridges. One last hymn to remind you, Rock of Ages. The songwriter says in one of the stanzas, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked I come to thee for dress. Helpless I look to thee for grace. Foul I am. I come to the fountain. Wash me, Savior, all I die. Effective praying is desperate prayer. It's a prayer of surrender. So whether you come to God in repentance, whether you bring a petition, whether you intercede for others, may we always remember, back to the beginning, that effective praying is accomplished by people who are close to God. Do not get into that habit of trying to keep a safe distance from God. Proximity is a prerequisite for impact. Number two, effective praying is rooted in righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. God sees that heart and it gives us a common bond with him that makes our prayers effective. Number three, effective praying may simply reveal God's agenda. Don't think simply about, I must get this. Slow down enough to hear God like Paul and say, it is for this reason that God is taking me through this, and this cross is raising me closer to him. And number four, effective praying is not a transaction with God. Do not try butter trade. The price is paid, Jesus paid the price. All you need to do is to surrender to him. Just take a moment and look at your prayer life and see if there's anything you'd want to mention to God about it. Thank you, Father in heaven, in Jesus' name, for your loving us and for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us and for opening the way for us that we can always come into your presence and know that you hear us. May the Holy Spirit continue to speak to us and to teach us how to pray. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.